You're listening to Blue Collar CEO, the podcast that's all about helping you build a better, more profitable, and more sustainable home service business. Each week, we'll cover a different topic that will help enable your company to move forward to success. And here's your host, Ryan Redding. What is up, Blue Collar CEOs? It's Ryan, and it's really good to be with you today. I am uh, getting ready to introduce you to Dave McDonald. Dave, you might not have heard his name before. Uh, he is the owner and founder of Better Together Group. Their company with actually two locations, one in Canada, one in, in Orlando, Florida. Uh, and they are a team that basically they aspire to help build and grow families one shift at a time. Essentially, they work a lot with people problems at businesses from hiring people, culture, things like that. Everything from helping recruit and attract and retain to actually doing consulting and strategic advising to leadership teams. But uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things about the workforce and the economy today because things are kind of weird right now. But uh, one of the things we're talking a lot about is like the trials of hiring and firing and really that business is about solving people problems, not just for your customer, but also internally. So we're going to talk about a lot of things. This is a fun conversation for me, but I'll shut up. Let's get going. Dave, I know that you are a man on the move and uh, you just recently came back from Florida. So thanks for taking time to like stop for a few minutes and like connect with us. But for those who maybe don't yet know who you are, do you mind? If, can we just start there? Like, who are you and what do you do? Sure. Thanks a lot. Hey, Ryan, appreciate the invite and the opportunity to talk. Um, yeah, my name is Dave McDonald. I'm the owner of Better Together Group. Uh, we are... Um, an employment agency and consulting group around uh, helping company owners solve people problems. So, you know, I like to say that business owners really only have two problems. Uh, they have money problems or they have people problems. And I don't know anything about money, um, but I do, we do know something about people. And so we help people solve uh, those problems around staffing, around hiring the right people, around creating culture and, um, you know, how to treat your team in a way that makes them want to keep coming back to work and feel like they're contributing um, and how to hire people uh, with what we refer to as the three I's, um, intensity, integrity, and intentionality. Ooh, I like those. Intensity, integrity, and intentionality. And by the way, you said there's only two problems. There's money problems and people problems. I've often heard that those are reduced down to money problems <laughs> at the end of the day. Like, <laughs> you have enough money, you can find the right people. Like, well, everything's a cash resource problem. And that I would say that that's fair. And um, if you've got lots of cash, you can hire me to solve your people problem. So we're happy to work, <laughs> work through that problem process. Solved. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what what sort of problem you have, there is a who that can be found. That's right. That's right. Yeah, but it, honestly, finding the right who culturally and you know that you can trust, like the reality, like I don't know about you, but yeah. in my business, I've hired I've hired ten or fifteen different consultants over time, and and eventually they all turn into Charlie Brown's teacher. It's all just wah, 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 wah. And so um, like I need a trusted advisor um, who's bringing valuable content, but they also have to like get me and I, I have to want to work with them. I don't, I don't want to deal with a wonk who, who's super smart, but can't articulate it. What? Well, yeah. And there's, there's also, uh, I'm, I'm sure you see some of this too. Maybe, maybe not so much in the like hiring people space that you're in but um you know there's a whole lot of people who are like stepping into the guru sort of mantle uh you really might not have a whole lot of accolades or reason to wear said mantle but here they are giving people advice so it's like it's like going to a golden corral and getting weightlifting advice from the person in the chocolate buffet line. Like it's just kind of a weird fit sometimes, you know? Yeah. Well, I, um, let me be I'm not knocking golden corral. Look, I love it. No, no. Hey, corral. if, if, if you can get unlimited mashed potatoes and unlimited roast well, beef, you? like how can you go wrong? Why wouldn't you? I know. That's so, what I'm saying. Um, but I think that you're really right. This is a world of, um, everyone's an expert, um, which means no one's an expert. And that's a real challenge. 
Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, my LinkedIn profile says I got my MBA from the school of hard knocks. Um, and, you know, I wasn't much of a student growing up. Let's say I failed grade nine French with 49%, when 50 was a pass. And all that said was that my teacher really hated me. Um, <laughs> she didn't give you that one point. I just right? point five. Yeah, it's I just like, five. come on, come on, help a guy out. But, um, you know, like my, my grades through high school, I, you know, I was a straight fifties, sixties, get by, you know, now what do they say? D's, D's get degrees. Um, and that yeah. was kind of my plan through all of high school and college. So that's crazy. So, yeah. so like here you are in the other, uh, like of the other end of like maybe the career cycle, right? Where it's like, you kind of go, you have this business. Now you help other people work on their businesses. Like, so like full circle on that way. What are, I feel like at least the, the men and women in the trade specifically that I talk to every day, they all have some aspect of people problems. It's either like if you use EOS language, it's like right people, right seats. Mm -hmm. It's enough of the right people in the right seats. Sometimes it's a leadership management training culture sort of thing. What are some of the things you feel like uh, you kind of consistently see as a theme of like uh, trades companies really struggle with people because fill in the blank. Yeah, I would, I would say that. Um, so I, I deal with mostly um, blue collar workers, trades people. Um, I don't, we do a little bit of work in professional services, but really most of what we do is a guy, people who, guys and ladies who are getting their hands dirty, whether it's truck drivers or installers or forklift operators or, you know, uh, you know, uh, mechanical engineers that work in the plant on machines. Um, but in, in all of those situations, you run into a thing where um, the worker feels like the owner is taking advantage of them hmm. that they're putting them out to work at 30 bucks an hour and billing them out at 120 bucks an hour and the rub is is really rough on that because the worker doesn't necessarily understand the intricacies of the other things that eat into the ninety dollar difference. Yeah, and I and I see, and it's interesting. So from an employee standpoint, I haven't really thought about it that way because you're right. Of like, there's this perceived gap. Employees don't understand like payroll burden. They don't understand the admin expense. They don't. They just don't. The cost of doing business that they're employed. They don't, by. They don't understand the. They don't understand the the risk that that has to yeah. be mitigated, and the legal expenses and. You know, just, you know, when, where business owners are hanging it out there every day, all day, like yeah. I, I employ a lot of truck drivers. And so every night when I go to sleep, I'm afraid somebody's going to get in a wreck. Um, yeah. And that's not a good way to live. I wouldn't recommend that. But installers, you know, when you're working on plumbing in somebody's home or um, you're working on HVAC systems in somebody's home. And there's the potential that you're going to uh, reroute carbon dioxide in the wrong direction. Um, there's a huge risk to that. Yeah, totally. It. And it's funny because I, well, and they don't, employees don't, but I, I know customers, like customers totally don't think about this. I remember, was it just yesterday? I was in a, a Facebook group doing something. Oh, and somebody's like asking for like recommendations of a plumber and, you know, how much they charge or whatever. And, and they're like, the, the customer was like, some guy came out and quoted me $200 for whatever. Um, like, I can't imagine why a plumber is worth $200. And then there's like some CNC programmers like, I don't even make $200 an hour and I'm a CNC. Pro and you're like, it, even most cust like customers like don't realize how much it costs to exist on payroll, to have a van, to run gas in it, to like... Right. The cost to a lot of home service businesses to exist alone is staggering. Yeah. I just, I just got a quote to have some tree work done um, uh, at my home. 
and uh, $4,200 to take down 10 limbs and one palm tree. And, um, but like, I don't want to do it. I, I can't do it. Um, like yeah. I, can, I own a saw, but I'm not taking that stuff down. I'm not. And you I was going to say, you could probably let like gravity do things, but you might, your house might not exist when it's yeah, it'll, it'll cost me a hundred thousand dollars in repairs to the house to do that. And so <laughs> like, like the reality is, is I, I, I grew up, I grew up on a hobby farm with a dad who did all his own work. I, you know, I did all around fencing. We, um, we tattooed our own, we, uh, branded our own cattle. We, we did all sorts of stuff ourselves. It was crazy. And I grew up going, I don't want to do that. I want to grow up and make enough money that I can pay professionals, not just to do my accounting or not just to do my law work, yeah. but to take care of my home and really, um, make things safe. Cause you know, yeah. my dad, my dad's idea about checking the electric fence was run down and, and pee on it. See how that works. Did it work? I never tried. I did grab it a few times. Oh, so you look, you say that you're a 49 student in French, but clearly you understood some basic electrical engineering stuff. So good job. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. A water connection. It's funny because, yeah, I had, I had a similar, uh, the salt water, man, the saline, the, uh, I had a similar sort of thing with my dad because my dad, a lot of people may or may not know, uh, had a pest control business like in the eighties, early nineties. And I saw like how hard that guy worked to take care of his family. Like his body broke, you know, it was just hard, grueling work. And I remember being like, I, I don't like, I, I remember like him struggling to like kneel at like baseball games. Like when I was like in little league, like to help bat, you know, when you're a little kid and I'm like, I don't right. want to, struggle to like hang out with my kids and do their activities. I remember that being also, and it's not peeing on a fence, but um, totally well, understand. Like the, like the reality the is, is boomers busted their ass. Like they did. That's just what they did. Yeah, they did. They got, yeah, they, they got did. up and they went to work every day. Like, you know, don't, don't get me going on Gen Z. Um, but uh, Gen Z is a lot better off than the millennials. Uh, you and I are probably both Xers, aren't we? I'm I'm not going to answer that question. I am very young and very spry. Thank you. Sorry, man. Your 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 gray and your beard was giving you away. That was I was just calling you out. Uh, I think that your cataracts. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. That could be it. Okay, Mister Millennia, I'll I'll give it to you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, no. So and uh, yeah, I'm right. Depending on whose chart dividing generational boundaries, like I'm either an Xer or a millennial. But sure. it's weird. I, I saw a guy speak actually in Orlando because I know you also uh, find yourself in Orlando a lot. Um, I, I was at a conference in Orlando maybe seven, eight years ago, and a guy came up who did just a lot of generational research. Like he was he was speaking about the different generations and the different like how generational groups behave and interact in the workplace and how you need to work with them and like uh, it was just fascinating. But one of the things that he pointed out that I don't think I realized until this thing was. Every generation is formed by what he called traumatic bonding experiences, basically like something external that uh, brought a whole generation of people together with a shared experience. So like for my generation, it was 9-11. Sure. Right? Like 9-11 to me, it was a very distinctive before and after. I was, was, I was uh, in college. I was a freshman. Like I remember the day like sure. vivid. But for my parents' generation... It would have been uh, the uh, the Kennedy assassination or uh, the moon landing, depending on kind of where they were. Like these sort of things that unite an entire generation. But that changes how people act and feel and respond and behave, right? Because it changes how you understand the world that you're in. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. And and you can see how COVID is going to be that for the Gen totally. Z generation. Yeah. yeah. And like my kids during COVID were they were probably too young to feel the trauma of that event. Yeah. Right. Like for them to be sent home from school in fourth grade or whatever it was for them, they're not really old enough to process. Like this has never happened before. Like this is nuts. This is crazy. Yeah. But if they are 13, Oh hell yeah. Like that's oh, yeah. all the kids that were like junior high to college. Yeah. Got 
Um, yeah. And they, they all have significant events that they missed in their life during that period. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it's, it's really changed a lot of things about that group, but I, th- I think that they're going to be great workers. Um, they're, they're, um, very different generation than millennials before them. And so I, I'm learning all about yeah. this. My daughter's one of them and she, Oh, okay. She, she's educating me, but we're a family business. And so all three of my kids work okay. in the family business. So every time I say yeah. something stupid in a group meeting, my daughter calls me out on it and fixes me in public. And um, I'm sure that's cool. Good. It's good. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sure that's really cool. Well, it's part <laughs> of the culture it, we're funny. trying to build. Uh, well, and that, I totally get that. But I but I also think like, okay, so there's stuff like that that your daughter's displaying, but there's also things like uh like digital nativity. So for instance, I remember my son, my son who's turning 14 in a couple months, which is insane. Um, but when he was young, like maybe around a year, maybe two, we were at my parents' house. And we never watch TV. Like I still don't watch a lot of TV, but uh, they had their giant TV on and they were watching Fox News or whatever it was at the time. And my son was like, oh, well, I'm used to using an iPad, right? All of us know iPads now. And he's like, I don't like this program anymore. So he starts swiping the TV like, like you would on an iPad, just kind of gesturing. And I remember being like, oh, good Lord. This is, even as a kid, he's instinctively learned a way to communicate and interact with technology at, like as a baby right. that most people will never experience or understand how deeply embedded that would. So his entire life, the way he learns in school, the way he's going to have a job is going to be totally adjusted by the fact that he is a generation that is used to iPads. He's used to FaceTime. He's just swiping for content on demand. Like, um, which, which makes me curious because I hear a lot of people, especially in the trades, but it's more than just the trades who complain that, oh, the workforce today sucks. I can't find any good people. No yeah. one wants to work. How much yeah. of it is that true that the economy shifted, the labor force has shifted where there aren't people available and how much of it is the workforce is available, but they look different. They interact different. They have different expectations. That's exactly that we don't it. recognize if you're older. Is that what it is? That's exactly it. Um, the people that say that the that um, there's no good people out there are wrong. There's lots of good people out there. Um, they haven't been matched with the right opportunities. They haven't been mentored in the right ways. Um, but if you're willing to invest in your people, um, time. Uh, your talents, your your tenure, your experience, then you can you can build up a next generation of great workers. And we've had some really great success with that here at Better Together Group, where uh, we've got some young uh, people that came in as uh, co op students a couple of years ago that are rising through the ranks into significant roles in our organization. And I just find that that's true everywhere. And I, you know, one of the things that I really struggle with is um, I, I don't know if you remember as, as you were coming into your entry years into the marketplace, but 50 um, year olds like me, I'm 53 always hate 20 year olds just do we're we're jealous we're like we're, like my my body isn't what it was at 20 my and my endurance isn't what it was at 20 my mind it isn't quite what it was at 20 um and now i have lots of experience that make me a lot stronger and better um, at 50 than I was at 20, but in your twenties, you're learning so much. You're, you're going to bump off the, like 20 year olds really should be driving bumper cars. They, they should have the room to bounce around a little bit because their brains, they're still figuring crap out. And at 50, if you don't know what you know, then you don't know nothing. Um, and so you really need to, you know, you need to build some grace into these kids that are coming up and trying to learn new things and find bumpers that you can put around them to keep your business safe and your um, 
and your interactions with them safe. And you, you need to understand that there's more things that you're, you know, most people in their fifties know that they're still learning a lot and they're more tuned into learning in their fifties than they were in their twenty than in their thirties and forties, probably. Yeah. And that's a really interesting point. I was, I had a conversation with someone at a, over bourbon the other night and this, this sort of idea came up where it's like for, for a lot of business owners, or let's say leaders, uh, owners especially, but for people who are in a leadership sort of function, a lot of them have learned by failure, right? About doing something, getting punched in the mouth a couple times, yeah, and then learning from it, picking themselves up and going at it again. And it's only by the failure that they become the leaders that we know them to be, right? They, Absolutely. They Absolutely. make mistakes. And yet... When they're put in a spot to lead someone who's younger, uh, a college intern, someone in their 20s who's looking for a fresh opportunity, like uh, we're often afraid as leaders or as owners to give that person the same chance to fail that we know we all benefited from so much. Right? right. And I like how you think about it like using a, the put the bumpers around like you kind of put little guardrails like they're not going to cause catastrophic damage. They're not going to kill someone. They're not going to sink the business, but give them the slack so that they can screw up so that they can develop the lessons and insights so that they can become the jealous 50 year old person, 50 year old person that you are. Right. Exactly. I th- one of the things that we talk about in our business um, with the staff here is. Um, we don't fire people for making active mistakes. If you tried something and it didn't work, we're going to have some grace for you on that. But we might fire you if you, if you had an opportunity and you didn't take a swing at it. Like if you just let it go by, you just went to sleep on it. Um, like I, you, you're, not, you're not going to hit the ball every, every swing. But if you never get the bat off your shoulder, we got a problem. It's almost it's like, not to make it a religious thing, it's like the parable of the talents. Like someone who like goes out and invests and buys something that makes more talents, like they're rewarded. But the person like plays it safe, bears it in sand, like I can't screw up. Like they get the ax. Yeah, well, like honestly, I, I, don't, I don't want to take it too far religious either, but that's exactly what Jesus was getting at, is if, if, you're, if you're going to hide what you've got, what what good are you doing? Um, yeah. and, but you need to take out what you have and share it with people and and do so in a way that's, you know, within your personality, but boldly. With confidence. When, yeah, yeah. When you when you look at kind of the labor force and the kind of the, the companies that are hiring, kind of the state of the economy, and you have you have a kind of unique vantage point because you see like a an American economic view. You also have a Canadian economic view that you keep yeah. in mind. And while they share things in common, oftentimes they're different. Very. Do you feel like, um, what do you feel like are the common things that an average business owner could do to start looking for the right people that they need? Is there certain sorts of language? Is there certain sorts of branding? Is there certain sorts of promotions? Or is this like, a, hey, be mindful of how to attract people to yourself? Like, how do you see? the sure. most successful people navigating the economy that we're in. Yeah. I, um, what I would say is that um, the best leaders are authentic leaders. Hmm. The best. And so um, part of being authentic is not harding, is not hiding from the hard things, the hard conversations. And so when you're, when you're trying to attract new talent, you need to talk about the excuse the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like it's yeah, not yeah. you can't just paint a great picture. This is one of the things that we find um, in truck driver recruiting is particularly uh, volatile that way, where um, trucking companies are selling the the best case scenario, and the guys are living out the worst case scenario and the dissidence that that creates in the relationship is such a problem and can never be overcome. And so you need to paint a realistic picture. And so in, in, you know, in your circles where we're, we're talking about guys that are, 
uh, doing home services or um, or other types of trades that are going into people's homes and stuff. They need to under, they need to hear the crazy stories about the lady that went batty on them one day. And they need to hear the good things about, you know, the lady that cooks them cookies every time they come over. They got to get both pieces of that. Um, they need yeah. to, they need to understand. And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning was um, the way that employers bridge the ignorance gap of their employees is by educating them. And so if you want your people not to be jealous of your $120 an hour bill rate on a $30 an hour pay rate, you have to educate them on the pieces of the businesses that they don't see. And you have to stop being fearful that when you teach them things, they're going to take that and they're going to go out and start their own competitor because they're going to, yeah. right? Like the reality yeah. is, is that a percentage of everyone that you hire is going to compete with you. And if you're afraid of that, just lock the door and close it down today. Yeah, that's that's capitalism at its core, right? I mean, a hundred percent it is. So, do you ever feel like that? There's you. You mentioned the word dissonance, and I really like because I'm going to use that again. Do you ever feel like there's a dissonance between companies uh, and their self assessment or self image of themselves? Like, for instance. Do they, do you find that people are often like, well, we're the best company to work for. Why wouldn't they want to like, do you ever feel like that there's this like uh, uh false identity that they tell themselves that sometimes yeah, they need to be corrected? Like guys, you're a shitty company with a shitty brand with shitty vehicles and shitty uniforms. Like no one wants to work here. I'm sorry. This isn't right. a money problem. This is a, you right. suck problem. Like, right. is that ever a thing? Yeah, it's often a problem. And what I would say is, is that the solution to it is authenticity and allowing people to speak truth back to power. The challenge is that, um, you know, I mentioned before, my daughter calls me out in public when I make mistakes. And she calls me out in private, too. Don't don't get me wrong. It's not always like, hey, slap. But um but we've you created from consequences if there's witnesses. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> so, it, but, but for me, there's, there's an element of, I want to always be improving. I want, and I want to create a transparent work environment. I'm not smart enough to lie to people. I, I have to tell the truth every day. Cause I'm, you know, a 52% student. And so like, just to keep on the straight and narrow, it's just, easier if I, if I do it right. And I tell the truth out, out the gate. And so if people can't speak truth to power, if they can't come to the owner and say, Hey, look, um, people are giving me the side eye because I'm pulling up in a 1999 F250, um, that's, you know, full of rust, then that's a problem. And so yeah. owners need to check themselves. Owners need to be humble and they need to be um, soliciting the input of the employees in such a way, creating a pathway for them to give the real feedback, not asking for I it in a it. way that they can't give the feedback, but asking for it in a way that there's a natural pathway and they've seen other people walk down the path and not get shot in the head at the end of the road. Yeah. And, and that's actually a really good distinction because I think a lot of people ask for feedback either rhetorically or sarcastically or condescendingly like, well, what would you do different if this was you? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sure. That's the, the wrong posture here, sir. Uh, but I, I actually, I really appreciate the way you kind of marry or at least bring to light kind of the importance of having the right people, like looking for the right candidates, understanding how they are, but also being the right company. Like in marketing, we'd say like, hey, you have good marketing, but you also have to be marketable. So it's this kind of mix of the owner, the leader, the company has a responsibility to present themselves, to represent the position well, to represent the company in the best light and not have the rusty 250, uh, to help find the people that they give permission to, to fail and to grow, to succeed. Um, in fact, you, have, you actually have a saying or a quote on your website, which I actually really like. It's this, your business specifically is built on the idea that a good employee is a great investment and a good job at a great company is hard to find. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a really poignant and beautifully well said 
uh, kind of idea that encapsulates not only what what you do, but also what makes great companies work. I'm I'm curious, Dave, because you've been so generous with your time. Uh, what if somebody wants to learn more about the Better Together Group and see what you might be able to do to help them? Sure. How might somebody reach out to you to learn more? Dave at bettertogethergroup.com is my email. Bettertogethergroup.com is our website for both Canada and the U.S. Uh, we help people hire people. Um, and we also do a little bit of consulting where if you don't have the culture you want, uh, we can come in and do some assessments and help you find a way to build a pathway towards that. Awesome. I will make sure that your stuff is in the show notes. So bettertogethergroup.com or Dave at bettertogethergroup, which will go to you, one presumes. And you have .com, not .ca for Canada, right? Yeah, dot, dot .com. Yep. I know you're crazy busy and you're a man in demand and you're also like just recovering from travel. So thank you so much for being generous with your time. Uh, it was awesome meeting you, man. Keep up the great work. I'll make sure all your stuff's in the show notes. Ryan, thanks so much. Great to, great to hang out with you. Thanks for the opportunity. This episode was hosted by Ryan Redding, author of the book on digital marketing for plumbing and HVAC contractors and founder of Leveragey the digital marketing solution for serious home service companies. You can subscribe to Blue Collar CEO on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us online at bluecollar.ceo and find us on Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode. See you soon.